All right, we are going to get started. Uh, it is uh, lovely to be here with all of you today. Welcome. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Gassman, and uh, I am a professor at Rutgers University. I also get to um, have the honor of serving as the executive director of both the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute for Leadership, Equity, and Justice, as well as the Rutgers Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And we are sponsoring this event through those institutions. I am going to do a quick introduction of my colleagues who are with me here, and then I'm going to hand it over to our moderator. So our event today, which is a uh, discussion of our brand new book, HBCU, The Power of Historically Black Colleges and Universities, which was published by Johns Hopkins University Press, just came out in January. Um, that's what we'll be talking about. And we're really thrilled to have Walter Kimbrough, uh, who was the seventh president of Dillard University and the 12th president of Phil Flander Smith College, and an incredible uh, commentator and advocate for HBCUs, knows so much uh, about HBCUs. He will be moderating a discussion between myself and my co-author, LaVon Esters, who is Vice Provost for Graduate Education and Dean of the Graduate School, uh, also a Professor of Agricultural Economics, Sociology and Education at the Pennsylvania State University. But more than that, he is a two-time HBCU grad, having attended FAMU and North Carolina A&T. So I am going to hand it over to you, Walter, and we are gonna start off with a structured Q&A, and then we're going to open it up. So please put your questions in the Q&A. And after we have a conversation with Walter, we will be taking all of your questions. So Walter, take it away. All right. And welcome again to everyone to participate in our conversation today. So I'll just start with a number of questions so we can warm everyone up. And as Meredith says, when you come up with ideas for questions, put them in the Q&A, and then I'll get to those to make sure you get engaged as well. So let's just start off and let's talk about uh, the book, the, the backstory of the book, how the book became to be. So if both of you will talk about, you know, why did you decide to write this book now and sort of what that backstory and process was. People are always interested in terms of book writing. How long did it take? What kind of process did you use? So give us a little insight into the, the process of this book and the idea behind it. Um, well, I I love that question, and I'll start out um, because uh, I you know I've been writing about HBCUs for almost twenty five years now, and I got a call from an editor at uh, Johns Hopkins University Press who I had been working with. I've published many books with them over the past, and uh, they had published one of my first books on HBCUs, which was Envisioning Black Colleges. And the editor Greg Brighton he said you know, I feel like it's really a time for a new book on HBCUs. What do you think? And I was writing another book at the time, but I said, that's a great idea. But I said, you know, I think I'd like to do things a little differently. And I'd love to write the book with an HBCU grad and also someone who, you know, has done some work uh, with HBCUs as well. So, and so I had in mind Levon. And Levon and I have known each other, I cannot even remember how long it is now, probably a decade, and yeah, 10 years. And um, so I called him up and I said, hey, Levon, would you be interested in co-authoring a book and about HBCUs? And I said, what I'm kind of envisioning is a book that includes the history, includes kind of the, the larger context, social and legal context, but also really, really represents the voices of all kinds of people affiliated with HBCUs and brings us up to the current day. And first thing out of his mouth was, I've never written a book. And uh, and I said, well, I know that he had just finished editing a book, but that's a different process. And so, but one thing he said to me was, I would love to eventually write a book about mentoring because Levon really cares a lot about mentoring and has mentored so many uh, HBCU students that went on to graduate school. And so he said, maybe I could learn more about writing a book if, if we did this together. 
So um, it really ended up being kind of an interesting process of writing a book together, but also mentoring Levon in the book writing process. And so I think we we ended up working on the book for uh, almost three years before it came out. It was 400 pages in a Word document, ends up being about 300 published. Um, it's a big book. It It's full and we probably could have put even more in it but our publisher wouldn't let us put any more and um you know it was interesting it was like a really good back and forth we included many many oral history interviews in it we uh and drew upon, of course, my past research, but also Levon has done research uh, related to partnerships, related to land grant institutions that happen to be HBCUs. So we drew upon our past research. We drew upon all of the research that's out there that so many people have done. And then we did all of these original interviews to um, make the book as fresh and lively as possible. And then I think the big thing that we did that really differentiates this book is that we wrote it for an every audience. So an academic can pick it up, an alum can pick it up, a student can pick it up, uh, someone from a foundation, someone from government. It doesn't really matter. It's written as if we're just all talking to each other like we're going to be today. So Levon, what do you what do you you know what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, I mean, you you know that you you hit the nail on the head as you always do. I think the thing that I would add to this the question um, is, you know, the interesting dynamic that Mary Beth and I had when we wrote this book is, as she just mentioned, I'm a two time alum, so I've lived right. I've been on two campuses, um, you know, and so I know really well what it means to be a student. Uh, in that in that context, you know, having attended FAMU and A and Not only that, as Mary Beth alluded to, you know, a, a lot of my work has been with the 1890 institutions. So I worked with 17 of the 1890, uh, 17 of the 19, excuse me, 1890 institutions. So about 15 years of my career has been dedicated to working with students and, and faculty and staff at those institutions. And I think the third thing, a full circle moment for me, is that my middle daughter Layla now attends Miles College, which is an HBCU in Birmingham, Alabama. So for me, having you know lived it and breathed it, having been a student, engaging in this work as a, as a scholar over the last fifteen plus years, and my daughter now attending, one of my three daughters attending, it's it's just it was an interesting dynamic. And so also, I, Mary Beth, I will mention it's pretty interesting. I've had a couple of folks who would DM me and say, "Well, you know, why are you all why are you writing this book, Levon? You haven't attended HBCU. I guess they haven't read the, the inside cover to know that." <laughs> slow, slow, slow down a little bit. I'm two time alum. So that's also interesting. But again, I think the perspective I have of having attended, you know, I can speak to that. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. Um, you know, I'm starting to peep at some of the Q&A, but, you know, a person asked, you know, was there any special reason that you chose Hopkins or is it because they reached out? And, and I guess I think the broader question is, how do you, probably for you, Mary Beth, since you've written a number of books and there are probably some people who are interested in doing that, you know, how do you sort of choose or figure out which, who's the best partner to do some of the work, particularly as it relates to HBCUs? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. It's kind of interesting um, because, okay, so at the time when Hopkins reached out to me, and part of this is that I've written four, uh, four books total with Hopkins, and all of them had something to do with HBCUs. Okay, so my first book, Envisioning Black Colleges, I wrote another book that's called uh, The Morehouse Mystique, which is um, about uh, Morehouse School of Medicine and its impact on, on uh, African Americans in medicine. And then I wrote a, another book related to uh, Booker T. Washington. Um, and, and, then, and then this book that we, that we wrote. And so the, one of the things about Hopkins is that they really are interested in this topic. So they they called me and said, "Hey, we know you've been doing this work, but you haven't really you re haven't really written an authored HBCU book, an edited. I've done a bunch of edited HBCU books, but that's completely different. That those are all kinds of different voices, and they they tend to be a little. Um, so, sometimes they don't always flow together as well as that you want them to. But in this case, this is the two of us writing." 400 pages, right? Uh, 
And so um, they they basically were interested. Now I was working. I I have I had a book come out shortly during the midst of this with Princeton University Press, and I'm working on another book with them right now. I could have ended up publishing with them, but Hopkins just I mean the editor just took a chance and asked, and and he was really supportive of my saying. I'd like to write this with an HBCU grad, somebody who I feel comfortable with, somebody who has also worked in the area, has mentored students. You know, that was really, really important to me. So um, I think that there are a lot more presses interested in work on HBCUs right now. They used to not be interested. It was very, very hard to get anything published, especially, you know, you might be able to get um, something that sells to libraries. But our book is much more of, we tried to make it a book that could be in, in any bookstore that is much more for a popular audience, even though it's very uh, academically rigorous. I mean, there's a lot of research in it, um, but there's a lot more interest there. For a long time, it was it was pretty hard to get a book published related to HBCUs. It's become a little bit easier, but Hopkins is interested in higher education. They had also published a bunch of Gina Garcia's books on Hispanic serving institutions. So they really liked the idea of somebody being able to come in and buy the HSI book and the HBCU book um, together um, because those are some nice compliments, very different, but you know, some nice compliments. So that's kind of how that played out. And one thing I will add to that, uh, Mary Beth, is that what I've observed from folks who've reached out to me is that, and not to say that this book is the end all be all, uh, but I, I will say that this book has, and I share this with you, right, Mary Beth, that this book is really, is really motivating folks to really want to engage in this work. Scholars and others I've talked to who say, wow, this book is really inspiring and, want, and, and, is, and is inspiring me to want to do this work and to really pursue this as a passion or pursue this as a research uh, agenda. So it's, you know, and then I'll, other thing I would say is also is the editor we worked with, Greg, I mean, he's been phenomenal. He he lives and breathes this. I mean, he has been from the time the time we started this process, he's been deeply engaged, has been our number one cheerleader, um, and, and he's he's really taken to and supported our work, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's shown you know, from the time we started to now it being released January 23rd. Uh, Walter, I was going to say, you know, the people always ask like how I got interested in HBCUs and I got interested in HBCUs because I read a book. I read The Education of Blacks in the South by James Anderson, who's a Stillman graduate, you know, professor at University of Illinois, recently retired, but but um, wrote this amazing book that that uh, made HBCUs central in this history, I read this book in graduate school completely changes my life because I was going a completely different track. So I hope, as as LaVon said, that people will see it. There's so many things in it that people could run with for dissertation topics, right? There's so many things that we tried to include. And the other thing is, it has a bibliography that includes nearly everything that's been written on HBCUs, which we read in order to write this book, right? So if you are doing, if you're a student and you're doing research related to HBCUs or if you're a scholar, you can look at the back of the book and it will give you, you know, everybody out there. Cause there's a lot of people out there and they don't get a lot of attention. Uh, and there are people doing work in sports and arts and, you know, all, all the libraries, all different areas. And so we try to really tap into all of that work. Yeah, maybe one more thing. Uh... Well, before we get to the next question, is one, and I know what this will come up later. One neat thing about this book is that anyone can read this book. I mean, it wasn't written with the academic in mind. A high schooler can read this book. A, a graduate student can read this book. My aunt can read this book. My grandmother can read this book. It's a book that we intentionally went about writing in a way that anyone can have pick it up off the coffee table and read it. Right, Mary Beth? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's. That's great because I think about myself a lot of times. I, I look at the uh, reference list first sometimes before I look at books, even though I didn't do that with this book. I just started reading through it. Uh, so, LaVon, I'm going to this question towards you um, because as both of you have talked about, you know, and, and having read the book myself, it, I mean, it is very much, 
you know, almost like it's conversational. You're hearing the stories. There's a good mix of, you know, some hard data, hard facts, but not so much. I mean, the nerd in me would like it, but some other folks might not like it. Right. But then you've got like interviews with about, you know, 15 or so presidents and other folks. Um, so talk about it when you guys are thinking about the mix of your qualitative and quantitative research and to make it readable. How, what kind of conversations did you have about that? And then how did you you know, sort of come up with this was the best formula for this book in terms of the mix, because I think the mix is really good that you don't, you know, overly bombard people with the numbers and the stats, but we need some of that in there to help set the, the framework as well. Yeah, well, in terms of the approach, of course, took the lead from Mary Beth and her expertise, and she'll talk about that in a little bit in terms of, you know, it being an oral history uh, approach that we took to the book. Um, but I think one of the things that, st that stands out for me in how he wrote this book is when we identified the folks that we interviewed, we had nearly 60 plus, 60 plus individuals who we interviewed. We wanted to make sure that while we included folks that were scholars and presidents like yourself and others, but also just regular everyday folk. I mean, we made sure that we included just regular everyday folks, some of which on this call today, as I look through, as I look at my screen today. So that was important to me and Mary Beth because we felt that having, including individuals who were just everyday folk, as I said, the reader could identify with those individuals. And I think personally, those conversations we had and those interviews we conducted with those individuals, to me, in many ways, were as, as fascinating and, and, and resonated with me, having been an uh, uh, HBCU grad throughout this process, more so than just as anyone else, I should say. So for me, that was an important part of this process. And that I made sure that when Mary Beth and I talked about the process, or how we want to approach it. I said, Mary Beth, we need to make sure we include regular everyday folk. Mary Beth. Yeah. Um, so I one of the things that I love about this book, and you know, I, I'm right now writing my 35th book, but I have to say that there are certain books that I love, and this is one of them that I love. And there are some that I'm like, yeah, they're it's, it's okay, you know, but um, this one I really love. And part of the reason why I love it is the oral history interviews. I mean, people were so honest with us and forthright and and just told us their stories and and the good, the bad, the ugly, just everything and trusted us that we would represent them in the best way possible. Of course, we showed everyone the transcript before, you know, so that they could correct it if they wanted to. But but um, and, you know, their names are mentioned, right? It's not the kind of research where people's names are masked. They were willing to use their names. I mean, we're so grateful to people for being willing to do that. The other thing is, I think, and, and Walter, you alluded to this, but we read every report out there, you know, all the reports by different, anything from APLU to, um, you know, re regarding land grant colleges to the United Negro College Fund, the Patterson Institute, all of their work to um, work that, you know, we've been doing at the Center for MSIs for years to all these um, federal reports. We read all that. We read extensively data from the federal government. We, we present that data because there are some people who will be convinced by the stories, but there are others who won't care. What they're going to be convinced by is the raw data, is the hard data. And so, you know, there's a chapter related to social economic mobility and the impact that HBCUs have. And that has a lot of data in it, but it's not overwhelming so that you would kind of get lost in it, right? It's it we wrote it in a way that is easy to to um, digest. But I will say that everything that we're saying is backed up by data. And for me, that's, I'm very proud of the book being accessible, but backed up by data. And I'll also tell you that there is some data that's not accurate out there. And we didn't use that data, even though we hear it all the time with regard to HBCUs. I told Levon as we were doing this, I was like, here's something that we hear all the time, but there's really no data backing up. It's like a circular argument where everyone cites it, but there's no data source. And so that was one thing that we wanted to make sure that every single thing that we say has a data source and people can follow that trail if they want to do more research in the area. I was on mute. Um, oh, 
this will sort of link to the next question, but I'm going to ask this question too. This is interesting. Is there an interview or interview or antidote that stands out to you as the most impactful in the book? I mean, you don't have to name me because I know mine was good too. But so <laughs> beyond me, uh, but I was going to say that. And, it, it, and it, it, but, but it, but it, no, but it, it links to another question too. It, it, so you can answer both of them. Is there a particular interview? But you know, when you do this kind of research, there's always these different aha moments, things that you didn't really think or expect. So talk about, you know, was there one interview that really stood out, but then was there just some larger epiphany that you had or something that raised your eyebrow to say, okay, I want to research this because I didn't think about this. Yeah. LeVon, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. My, yeah. So uh, I'm going to share what I shared yesterday, right, Mary Beth? The one that stood out for me, Walter, was the interview that we did, and Mary Beth, if I may, share a little bit of background that we had with Ibram Kendi, Ibram X Kendi. He only gave us 15 minutes. As busy as he is, he gave us 15 minutes. And maybe Brother probably elaborate on this. And we took it, I mean, he dumped a lot in that 15 minute window. It was a phenomenal interview. But he's a fan you grad like myself. But you know, when you you know you read about Ibram and his work and you follow him on social media, and you know, here I am having met, you know, having never met a lot of these individuals and I tell my brother all the time, it was like an independent study, Walter, this whole process every time. But for, with me, when Ibram spoke and we conducted that interview, I had we had that shared experience and everything he talked about and, 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 and what he felt and, and how what he experienced in family, I experienced, Walter. And for me to make that connection, have that shared identity with, with Ibram, I came away at, at the end of that day, I was at home, I was like, wow, this, this is pretty fascinating. So for me, by far, among a lot of interviews, that one stuck out. And I think the other thing that stuck out for me, Walter, was the women as a group, the women we interviewed, phenomenal storytellers in terms of what they shared, uh, phenomenal, great Black women who shared their stories and love their past for HBCUs as a collective. Those interviews stood out for me. So those two, the, collective, the collection of Black women and what they shared, but also this, this, this case that was close to home to me with that interview with Eva. Mary Beth? Yeah, um, I uh, I have to say that uh, Levon and I have talked a lot about this and I wasn't surprised by this, but I was, um, because I assumed this interview would be incredible, but I found it breathtaking. And that was the interview with Ruth Simmons, who, you know, had come out of retirement to be the president of Prairie View and had been the president of Brown. And I mean, I told LaVon afterward, I said, I need to go get the most advanced dictionary and read it because Ruth Simmons has the most beautiful, challenging vocabulary I have ever heard in my entire life. I mean, we literally afterward were writing down words and looking them up because her her vocabulary is so beautiful and graceful and just I mean, she and I've interviewed a lot of people. OK, like just, you know, to be really frank, I've interviewed um most of the presidents of the United States since I've been alive. And Ruth Simmons is the very best interview I've probably ever done in terms of just blowing my mind, just blew my mind. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, they call her like Ruth the truth, right? And and um, she was so frank and so self-reflective of her journey and she has a new book out i hope people will read it it phenomenal phenomenal i'm almost done with it um so self-reflective so um forthright in what she does well and what where she could have done better along the way that interview was uh to me one of the ones that i after we did it i was like oh I, I feel so lucky that we got that. And another one, and uh, LeVon was alluding to the women, um, Mary Schmidt Campbell, the former president of Spelman, uh, she told us this story about a book club that she had developed at Spelman. And um, they decided she got the young women to read Hamilton. And she told us how she ended up if, if they came to every session that for the book club on the Spelman campus, this group of young women, she would take them to go see Hamilton on Broadway 
And she even had, you know, the author of Hamilton, the book to come and meet with the young women. And in so many ways, she was completely changing their lives. You know, just, I mean, these are amazingly talented young women and she's just giving them so much access. And, and it also spoke to her strengths, right? Because she's someone who's deeply rooted in the arts. And, um, and that's one area that we didn't forget in this book. We mentioned HBCU contributions to the arts because that's so important and people forget about it. It's so, so important. I have a student right now, um, Kemuel, who's working on a dissertation related to uh, Black curators who were educated at HBCUs, right? Because where else would they have been educated historically? HBCUs have an impact on everything and anything related to African Americans and way beyond. So I think those two interviews really stood out. And I would say the lar the the big thing was, even though I've been doing this work for a long time, I was I felt really heartened that I there was you just discover more and more and more of the contributions of HBCUs. And, you know, it really makes me mad when people dismiss HBCUs because every single thing over the years where I have, you know, done research or written a book or engaged with people at HBCUs, and I didn't attend one, but I've been to 103 out of the 105. Many, many times I've served on the board of trustees of three of them. And um, you find more and more and more and I feel like often people who don't know much about them, they just don't even understand. They don't oh. understand the richness. And yeah, Mary Beth, I mean, not to play on the title of Mary Beth and Walter, but Mary Beth, your last point is well taken because when you, after all those interviews we conducted, you truly understand it. And it'll be hard for anyone if they sat in the room when we interviewed these folks that there is truly, these are truly powerful institutions, no doubt. I mean, they are extraordinarily powerful institutions. And maybe to your point, it's a shame that that gets lost in the larger narrative nationally because, I mean, I mean, Walter, you know, it's two time president and the work you do is they are truly powerful institutions, is basically what I was saying. So here's a, a follow up from the QA that I want to ask. How did you go about selecting the people to interview? And was there anyone who was not included that you wish you were able to include? So that is a really good question. And this is how we did it. Um, we, the two of us generated a list of everyone and anyone who we, we would want to interview. We we put that list together and I, I just told Levon, I was like, think big. Don't worry if you think the person's unattainable. And then we started going through the list and making sure that we had, because we knew we, you know, we only had so much time because we had a book contract. <laughs> so um, making sure we had representation across as many areas as possible, making sure that, um, you know, th th these were going to be uh, interviews that would really bolster what's, what, what we wanted in the book, the, the chapters as we had defined them. And then we started reaching out to people and um, we, by and large, everyone we asked said yes. There were a couple people that ended up like, you know how sometimes you'll commit to an interview and then someone in your family passes away or something, you know, somebody, I think one person was diagnosed with something. So we had to cancel the interview, but by and large, we were able to get all the interviews. Now, there are a few people who we use pre-existing interviews for we, who we didn't get interviews with, like Kamala Harris. We I, we didn't try to get an interview with her, um, mainly because of our time frame. Or um, we did try to get an interview with Stacey Abrams, but we, we couldn't get someone who knew her close enough. So we were trying to do that. Um, and, uh, so that's kind of how we, we did it. And in the end, we, um, we, every single person who said yes, we ended up doing an interview with, 
and uh, feel like we got a really, really good group of people. I mean, I will tell you that part of the way that you get interviews, we got interviews with a lot of presidents. We got interviews with a lot of very active alums, um, people who are writers, people who are professors, people who are doing work in communities. The way that you do that is by relationships. So, you know, over the years, I've developed a lot of relationships with people. Levon has um, many of the people that we interviewed who um, had um, were in grad school were people that Levon had had you know met and had relationships with, and so those are that's kind of how you do it, you know, especially if you're doing interviews where you're going to identify people, they have to trust you, because I I mean there are people who might take what you say and misuse it and we had to have that trust built up and they knew that we would let them see the transcript, uh, make changes if they wanted, that, and that we would not misuse or take their words out of context. That was incredibly important. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is, I, I would say a few things, Mayor Beth is not being uh, absolutely truthful. A lot of these folks were in her Rolodex, I'm just playing. They were <laughs> what, what? They were, your, they were in your Rolodex. Oh, they were, that's true. <laughs> right, they were. They were. But no, if, if I could have added some folks, I mean, of course, Kamala Harris would have been on my wish list, Stacey Abrams, Ralph, Ralph Warnock, some athletes, you know, Jay Rice, for example. We talked about some athletes we could have gotten access to, but it was difficult to do that. But Walter, I think those are some of the folks, if I could have, if we could have tapped into those folks, I would have said, man, let's go for those, Mary Beth. Okay, sounds good. And just as a reminder to everyone, um, you know, as you think of different things, you can add those questions in the q and I've we we're going to save some of them, but if they pop up and they're related to the question I'm asking, I'll ask them then, but the others I still have, so I'll come back to those as well. So just let the folks know who already submitted some things. I'm coming back to those questions as well. Um, so, so one of the themes in the book is identity and empowerment. They're key themes. And so for both of you, just share, how do you think HBCU shape identity um, and how they empower their students for life? Um, this is one of my absolute favorite chapters in the book because um, so many people we interviewed talked about the just profound impact that going to an HBCU had on their identity and their racial identity, other identities as well, but their racial identity changed profoundly. And I think you know, earlier Laban was talking about how what Ibram Kendi said really resonated with him. And Ibram talked a lot about his his identity, right? And how how he he grew and learned. And um, one other thing we do in the book is that um, Laban wrote the preface about his own experience uh, going to two HBCUs, and he wrote about his identity development. But across the board, there wasn't really one person who had attended an HBCU. We interviewed a lot of other people too who worked with HBCUs, but there wasn't one person who attended an HBCU that didn't talk to us about how um, their HBCU experience pushed them, how it shaped them, how it uh, challenged them to be the very best that they could be. A lot of people talked about, you know, maybe how they didn't do their best initially. And then a professor pulled them to the side or an administrator pulled them to the side. And I think, and really helped to shape who they who they are. Then we had other people who didn't go to HBCUs, but might've been a president or a faculty member or provost or um, someone who works with HBCUs and told us, it's my role to help develop the identity of students. And if you think about that at a majority institution, you rarely hear anybody say anything like that. So it's very purposeful. And Levon, this was so personal to you as we were doing this. So I'd love to hear you. Yeah, no, it was. It was very personal for me. And, and, and I will respond in, in these ways. You know, attending an HBCU, in, in my case too, you really came way understanding what it means to be a black person. You know, the S is a blackness. Uh, I mean, I can't overstate enough how important that was to myself, my peers who attended FAMU and A&T. Uh, it was a powerful mechanism. And as Mayor Beth alluded to, mentioned a minute ago, even shared that. And so not just in terms of that identity aspect, but even just 
resiliency in terms of the confidence that you had when you graduated. So I went to two HBCUs and eventually made my way to Penn State for my PhD. I knew I could I could hang with folks at, at Penn State. I had no doubt in my mind that I could do the work, I can get through this, my program, and, and lead a successful lifetime after that. And I think the other thing that I would say is this, you know, even though, and I also I would say this, you know, this notion of identity and how it's it's cultivated at HBCU, that aligned with what my K through 12 schooling was like. I'm from Chicago, from the South South Chicago, and, and K through eight was a very strong, powerful, this notion of blackness was in the school, school I attended from K through eight. And then even the high school I attended in Chicago, the same way. So for me, K through eight, nine through 12, and going to FAMU, it just it aligned perfectly. And I think the last thing I will say is this. Again, I mentioned earlier, my daughter Layla attends Miles College. And even though she grew up in a household where she understood what it means to be a black woman, a black girl, you know, I, I've seen her grow. And this is only her second semester. She's a freshman now, but I've seen growth in her at Miles College from attending Miles. And so for me, it's a powerful mechanism attending an HBCU where this notion of blackness and black identity is, is weaved through everything that you do with that institution. All right, that sounds good. Um, one of the things I appreciate about the book, and just to make sure folks haven't, if you haven't seen the book before, I just want to make sure you know, I got to put the plug in um, <laughs> for the book. Um, chapter eight, and I like it because the, the book is overwhelmingly positive. It's written from, not from a deficit perspective, but here are all the great things. But it is real enough to say, we still have some challenges too. And there's a chapter that talks about some of the challenges that the institutions are facing. Uh, as we were preparing to, to jump on for this call, I was just letting them know, and hopefully the folks on the call know as well, that today the appeal for St. Augustine's University with Southern Association of Colleges and Schools was denied. So technically they have lost accreditation. They'll, they'll file a lawsuit, go through that process. Um, but that generally is a strategy that schools will use to make sure they can complete the semester out so those students can graduate with an accredited degree um, because there's an additional cost with that. So that's, you know, that situation brings up a lot of the challenges that you mentioned in that chapter in terms of wars, in terms of graduation rates, in terms of messaging and telling the institutional story. Um, can you all talk a little bit about thinking about that chapter and you also try to provide some solutions, but Talk a little bit about what you hope people get out of that chapter and, and how we can really start to dig in and address some of those issues because we're we're still having those challenges that end up taking an oversized role in terms of the HBCU narrative. And like I said, this book does a good job presenting a very balanced and really strong HBCU narrative, but it's fair enough to say we still have some work to do too. And I think that's important to do. So any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I really appreciate you asking about that. So I've got a couple of thoughts. And also, I'll tell you a little bit kind of about our process with that challenges chapter too. So, so one thing is, um, you know, a, a, just to address the uh, accreditation issue, uh, this is an area where um, some HBCUs, uh, they tend to tend to not always tend to be smaller have very small endowments um, and uh, ha and typically accreditation issues are financial. It's typically not the academics, it's the financial issues. That's where HBCUs will get tripped up. So that's definitely something that we talk about. And a lot of times that trip up has to do with um, lots of leadership turnover. Um, if you if you take a look right now, there's a lot of leadership turnover at HBCUs. I'm very happy that we're seeing some of those positions being filled. I saw both uh, Grambling and Central State be filled as of yesterday or this morning, I think I saw. So when we were working on this, um, you know, of course, we wanted to approach things from an asset perspective. But, you know, I find it really challenging when I hear people who are doing research saying, oh, I'm doing asset based research. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, it's great to approach something with an asset perspective, but you cannot forget the challenges because if you do, the assets will 
just start to whittle away. They, they won't be there. You've got to address the challenges. And so in the conversation and, you know, as we were writing this book, Levon and I, we would meet in different cities. We would meet at, um, you know, come to Philly, go to different, we met in DC. I can't even remember all the places we met where we would get together and talk through things. And at one point I said, Levon, we're going to have to have a challenges chapter. And that was, that was hard because we're like, I, I care really deeply about HBCUs. I don't like when people bash HBCUs. Levon, two-time grad, not wanting to really, you know, air any dirty laundry, anything like that. So the way that we did it was we asked everyone we interviewed, what are the challenges that HBCUs face? And we really drew upon their voices. These are experts, right? A lot of the people who gave us the challenges were presidents, some were board members, some were faculty, alumni. And so we, you know, we, I, I think some of the big ones, accreditation, uh, endowments, like that are very small, um, financial issues, leadership, um, graduation rates, even though we know that graduation rates are not looked upon in a fair way in comparison to majority institutions, it's still troubling when they are very, very low. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things we discuss in the book, but the difference between the way we might do that and the way, let's say, a really not so nice scathing media article might do it, or a scholar who doesn't understand the larger context is that we put everything in context. So here are some reasons why this is happening. You know, why do HBCUs have financial problems? Well, let's take a look at systemic racism and the underfunding of HBCUs since their very beginning. And let's take a look at what happens when you're underfunded that long. Or if we're talking about the lower endowments, are we blaming HBCUs or are we taking a look at how endowments have been built and how systemic racism has been a part of that? With regard to leadership, there are some substantial issues with regard to uh, boards of trustees who have meddled a bit too much in when a president is trying to lead. Those are those are conversations that are really important to have. And you know, I'm very proud that I'm on two HBCU boards right now. Um, I'll shout out Morris Brown College and Paul Quinn College, both uh, African Methodist Episcopal uh, HBCUs, and they both have boards that want the president to do, in, in this case, his job. You know, you brought this president in, they're a highly talented person, let them do their job, you should be dealing with the bigger issues. That is not always the case. It sometimes is, it works out in a different way. And um, these are discussions that we have to have. So we put them in the book and Walter, you alluded, to the fact that we also put a whole chapter about how we can make a difference, how we can transform things. And to me, that's how, that's, you gotta do that, right? If you're gonna bring up the challenges, then let's come up with some solutions as well. So, Levon? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the, what I would add is, you know, again, this is my first time writing a book and Mary Beth and I talked about this. To be fair to ourselves and to be fair to the book writing process, we had to talk about the challenges to not discuss them or to try to have to veil them in some way or, or hide them wouldn't be wouldn't be good for the book or for our audience, right? Our audience, our readers. That's one. The other thing I would say is that, um, and I shared this yesterday at an event uh, that Mary Beth was here at Penn State we were doing, is that despite the challenges that were identified, every person we interviewed that graduated from HBCU would still attend that institution again if they had to do it over again, right? They were still, the, 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 the pride, the love they have, Walter, for those institutions, despite the challenges, they were still, if they had to do it all over again, would still go back and attend that institution. And I think the third thing I would say, maybe you talked about board leadership, and Walter, I've seen some of your work in this space, and another issue that we have to figure out how we can deal with, I know maybe you're doing it through uh, the aspiring leaders program is presidential leadership, the turnover. I mean, that is something that 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 is also a big concern for me, um, and it's something we're going to have to figure out how we can deal with. But I think again, to be fair to the process, we had to take a balanced approach to writing this book, which hence we talked about the challenges. But again, we came back 
the next chapter later talk about what can we do to improve them. Yeah, and just to let folks know, um, as a part of my uh, residency with uh, Mary Beth Center uh, in April, I'm going to do a webinar and talk about boards and uh, president, because I've been fortunate to be with two really good boards, and you realize how fortunate you are when you're looking at some of the other things that are happening. So I think there are some lessons based on the things that I've seen and talk about some of the turnover and things that both asp aspiring presidents can do, but things that boards really have to do too. So just to put that on your radar. Here, here's a question from the Q&A that links. Uh, I'm going to let Mary Beth add, answer this one, even though I have a lot to say on this one too, but I'm going to let her run with this because we talk about some of the challenges and there is a section of America that thinks everything with HBCUs is great right now because the former president did all these things. So the question was, has the former president really done as much for HBCUs as he says, and now that's being parroted by people like Tim Scott and Byron Donald. So I know Mary Beth has talked about this very openly in the media like I have, so I'm just going to let her uh, set the record straight. Yeah, and feel free to chime in. Uh, the former president, President Donald J. Trump, has absolutely not done very much at all for HBCUs. I mean, one of the things I'll I'll give Trump credit for is he's a master at, um, at uh, talking. Right. So he's really good at saying, well, you know, I established the HBCU White House initiative. That is not true. Not even remotely true. The initiative has been around for a long time. Right. And um, the other thing is he will talk about money that he gave to HBCUs. But that money was uh, it was being given over and over year after year. And it's really allotted by Congress. And so, you know, there's a, there, there's one thing you've got to do is you've got to dig deep. And, and Walter, you've done such a good job at this by, I see you all the time taking on people who try to um, say that Trump has done all this work. I think if you take a close look, what you see is that's not true. Now, here's another thing that I hear over and over. I always hear people say, well, President Obama didn't do anything for HBCUs. I got so mad at that one time that I wrote a whole report, which I'm happy to give to people, about what President Obama did for HBCUs, because there's actually a lot that he did. Now, I will say this, Joe Biden has done more for HBCUs than anybody. I mean, it is absolutely remarkable how much he has done. And you know, part of that is because he has been able to do that. He's in a position to be able to do that. It's a lot harder for the first African-American president to come in and all of a sudden start allotting a whole bunch of money to HBCUs. Now, just imagine what ends up happening to you in this you know, country that we live in where racism is prevalent every day. With Joe Biden, he, uh, he's got Kamala Harris right there next to him. He's got an HBCU grad next to him all the time. And I, I think that has benefited HBCUs greatly. Um, I think if we were to talk about who's done the most for HBCUs in terms of being a president, I would put Joe Biden right up there. But I can't find hardly any evidence of, of what Donald Trump did that was out of the norm of the presidents that went before him. So I'd love to hear your comment about that, Walter, too. Well, just, you know, very briefly, um, yeah, he, Trump has just been great in terms of saying the same things over and over again. And he says them so convincingly that people believe it. So um, I just wrote an op-ed, hopefully uh, paper's going to pick it up, but listening to him Friday night with the Black conservatives in uh, South Carolina, he tells a story about how the presidents came back every year begging for money. And I would just tell people, think critically. The only time that you knew presidents were there at the White House was the time that picture was taken in February of 2017. Yeah. If, if they were coming back every year, there were 45 people. And it was funny, too, because he said there were 45 of them. You know, he made that number because he was a 45th president. I mean, that's what I'm just telling because there are over 100 HBCUs. So he said yep. all the HBCU leaders came was 45 of them. That's a subliminal message to you that he's lying just right then and there. <laughs> but he just... He just goes on and on about, so then in this, he, so the lie keeps evolving. And so then he said that he, he's talking about this Title III uh, F program, which was started under W. This is a program under yep. W that was $85 million a year. It was a two-year program. It sunsetted. Obama led it sunset. People raised hell and told Obama. So he said, all right, all right, I'm going to get a 10-year program. 
So then you have Trump saying, because he let his son said as well, but he said, We're, I need to give you long-term funding. So I'm going to do something nobody's ever thought of. I'm going to give you 10-year funding. You just throw out a number and I'm going to add some money on top of it. Alma Adams wrote the bill for that money and it was $85 million, just like it was yes. when Bush started it. It's the same, but he lies and his audience knows nothing about HBCUs. As I tell people, they could name two HBCUs if you told them four. They know nothing about these institutions, <laughs> but he gets over. So they'll really just defend him to say, he's the one that did this for HBCUs. It's like, that's not true, but he's such a great uh, propagandist. Oh yeah. And so you have that. people, so I give him credit for that. He's the best we've ever seen. He's oh great God. at getting people to believe those things, but he is absolutely lying and you can prove it by fact, but we're now in a post-factual reality, which yeah. makes it sort of frustrating. And I tell people there are there is subtle racism the way he tells a story because he keeps talking about begging every year. And I tell yes. people HBCUs go through the same appropriation process as the EPA, as TSA, right. the Department of De Defense has to have their budget reviewed annually. And nobody says that the, the Joint Chiefs are going to beg for money. So he says that. And then for this one on Friday night, he says, I gave him all this money. He said, and I told him, now you don't have to come back and kiss somebody's ass. Ugh. All that is subtle racism. And people is. are letting it that is. go. So I think we have to keep pushing back on that. So anyway, I wanted to, to ask that Great. question. It was I in the chat as well as a, as a, um, a, a, a moment of levity in terms of some yeah. of the things. But that's why we have to read books like this so people can understand the fullness of our uh, historically Black institutions. Right, okay, and I'm so glad you brought up Alma Adams because talk about yeah. a champion for HBCUs who has been able to get HBCUs so much money. I mean, yeah. her oh. name should be on uh, everybody's list of the top champions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, that's a funny because after he kept doing that, she put on Twitter, she said, there he goes again, taking credit for my future act. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> funny. But it's like, yeah, it is her. She championed it. So, yep. um, okay, so for both of you, uh, and Mary Beth, you mentioned one chapter already, but Name like your what's what do you think is your favorite chapter? Uh, I, that's for me. I would say um, ment, chapter mentory, chapter five, as Mary Beth alluded at the beginning when she read the bio, um, because that's one of my sphere of expertise. I mean, I've seen Victoria Parker here on the call. I think Cornell, one of my other students, yeah, he's still on the call. Mary Beth, you know both of them. They were two of my grad students uh, at Purdue, and they know my love for mentoring. I mean, I, I, I bleed it. I, I, I'm passionate about it. Um, I think I've done a pretty good job over the years. And a lot of my students, when I was at Purdue, uh, hailed from HBCU. So for me, being able to interview, and we interviewed a lot of students uh, and faculty members who attended HBCUs in that chapter five, where we learned about the impact that HBCU faculty had on how, how HBCU faculty mentored them, but also what they learned from that mentoring relationship and how they carry over into how they engage in terms of peer mentoring, in terms of mentoring uh, graduate students, undergraduate students, so on and so forth. So for me, hands down, chapter five is, is probably my favorite chapter. I mean, there are others, but that for me, because of my expertise, because that's a that's a that's a work that I that I live and I die for. I would die for to, to, I would I love to stay engaged in this work, and and I continue to do that in my current role here as dean. Of the grad school at Penn State, and it's one of my priority areas actually. So for me, that hearing those narratives, hearing those stories from those students and those faculty members, and even the presence alike, that by far made chapter five my favorite chapter. Yeah, and mine, um, there's a chapter called Scholars and Leaders, and I really love that. It's the longest chapter in the book. And one of the things that we did is as we were talking to people, we kind of chronicled their lives and really took a long look at some of the scholars and leaders um, talking about like, you know, uh, this is just an example. There were so many people who ended up leading an HBCU who started off attending kindergarten at that HBCU going to middle school across the street from that HBCU, sometimes attending that HBCU. And we saw it over and over where there was this pattern of the HBCU being the entity that introduced them to education and culture and, you know, like helped with their socialization. And then people came back. They either came back as faculty or they came back as 
provosts or presidents, and they talked about how growing up near an HBCU just fundamentally changed their lives and is part of who they are, not just attending it, but growing up near it. And so there are lots of those stories in that scholars and leaders chapter. Uh, another thing that we did is because we kind of divided that up into different areas. So there's a medicine area and a, and a literature area and an art area and sports. And, and um, we not only use the interviews that we did, but we also read a lot of um, biographies or used existing oral history interviews. Like we wrote about Kamala Harris in the um, sort of politics area. And we were able to do that because there are some really good oral history interviews that have been done with Kamala Harris or interviews in general. We were able to look at like some writers or some artists by looking at pre-existing oral history interviews. And, you know, for those people who might be interested in writing books or history in general, uh, I've always loved the fact that you can do your own interviews, but you can also use pre-existing interviews. And there are so many of them out there with people who have had a profound impact within the HBCU world. So that's probably my favorite chapter just because I love the storytelling in that chapter. So yeah, that would be mine. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Levon, in the book, you've mentioned several reasons why you chose to attend an HBCU. Um, which among those reasons resonates with you the most, particularly after doing this book project? Do you, when you reflect back on your reasons for wanting to attend, you know, what what resonates with you the most at this stage in your life? Well, I know Mary Beth uh, likes to chuckle when I say this because she resonates, she knows what I'm going to say. So for me, the number one reason, everyone, that I attended an HBCU was School Days, the movie. Hands down, no doubt. That movie, I, I remember, I recall my dad uh, taking me to see that movie. And as I sat through, sat in that movie theater, I was just, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. Uh, and at the same time, during that same time period, more or less, you had the Cosby show, you had Different World. And so you had those three, those three, uh, you know, how HBCUs were depicted in those three, the movie and then those two, television shows, I mean, I, I couldn't get it out of my system. Once. It was like, I, I lived, I mean, I slept, I, I breathed it. I just, I was like, I'm going to an HBC. Then on top of that, at the time, my brother-in-law, he had graduated from FAMU, from uh, SBI, the business school. And he would talk up FAMU all the time, just talking of FAMU. And then ironically, FAMU was always in the news at the time. They did the Bastille, 100th Bastille celebration, I think it was in France back then. And so you saw him all over the TV and then President Humphreys, Frederick Humphreys was the president. He was always in Chicago. Every time he turned around, he was in Chicago. So it was like, man, family was always in my face. And then I think the other thing I would say is when I think back on my high school days, a lot of my teachers uh, went to the likes of Tennessee State, Tuskegee, Alcorn State, Prairie View, Morehouse. So it was, it was like, Walter, I just was surrounded around HBCU. I mean, and so for me, it just filled my spirit and I knew that I was going to go there. And I think the other thing I would say is this, you know, so when I, in my community, a lot of students, of course, went to the likes of Illinois State, Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois. I had no interest in going to any school in the state of Illinois. No disrespect to those schools, but I said, that's not, that's not my cup of tea. Um, and so for me, I am, I cannot say how, Proud I am to have graduated from two HBCUs. I mean, FAMU and A&T. And, and, and if I had to do it all over again, I would do the same thing again. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Mayor Beth might remember, we, I think for a week, we did a blog for the New York Times. And that was one of the questions we talked about, the impact of those shows. And empirically, it showed that there was an increase in HBCU enrollment that was driven during that period of time with, with those shows and, and that movie. So um, I just thought back to that when we did that. Um, yeah, yeah. For you, for you, Mary Beth, I mean, you mentioned James Anderson's book, but can you think about another experience that you had, maybe when you were doing some work on a campus with a particular institution and you just said like, yeah, this this is why I really want to really dig in. I mean, you had the interest from Anderson, but did you have another moment that really, I guess, um, solidified your resolve to say, 
yeah, this is a space that I really want to dedicate, you know, my research. Yeah, actually, I mean, I can think about it instantly. And um, so after I read the book by James Anderson, I went to my PhD advisor and I said, I want to do, I want to write my dissertation related to historically black colleges. And he said, you don't know anything about that topic. <laughs> and I said, okay. So he said, you know, you can do that, but you, you, you cannot be one of these scholars who just writes from afar. You can't do that. You got to go, you got to start going to HBCUs and your entire career, you're going to have to go to HBCUs because you can't write from afar. And so the first thing I did is I, I, I got my PhD at Indiana University, Indiana University and I wanted to uh, write an intellectual biography for my dissertation of Charles Spurgeon Johnson, who was the president of Fisk University from 1946 to 1956. And um, famous sociologist, just an incredible, incredible scholar, incredible mind. And so I went to the Fisk campus. And, you know, this is me long, long time ago, really young. I think I was about 24. Went to the Fisk campus. First of all, if you haven't been to Fisk, it is a beautiful little campus in Nashville. It has some of the most beautiful buildings. It has Jubilee Hall, which, you know, was uh, built because of fundraising by the Jubilee Singers which are phenomenal. And it has one of the most beautiful art collections. It has these just gorgeous buildings with murals by Aaron Douglas. It is, it is breathtaking. And the library is filled with these um, gorgeous uh, drawings by Winold Rice and, and uh, just the archives are phenomenal. I mean, I ended up Johnson's papers at Fisk took up, uh, I think like an entire floor in their archive. And I went so many times, I think I ended up going seven times because I needed to get through all those archival papers. And I'll tell you, it was interesting because as I walked on the campus, I was the only white person that I saw. Um, and uh, I didn't know anybody there, but the archivist Beth House, she's passed away since then, but, um, and uh, the librarian, Jesse Fawcett, they were so kind to me and so lovely and so helpful and showed me everything. They, they pointed me in the direction of old oral history interviews that were there, of all kinds of papers. They made introductions for me. They told me people on campus I should talk to. And I what I noticed right away is that if that situation had been turned around, an African-American going to a majority institution doesn't know anyone, the majority institution is almost all white, I'm not sure if that kind of hospitality would have would happen. I mean, this was back in like 1994, right? I felt so included and just embraced. And uh, that did it for me. I just was like, this is what I'm going to do. And you know, if you're if you're a scholar, you've got to have something that you're passionate about. Like Levon is passionate about mentoring, right? You have to have something you're passionate about. And for me, it's always been that I think more people need to know about Black colleges. I think more people need to understand the um, incredible contributions. I'm a historian, but historically and current and into the current day of Black colleges and uh and really invest in them and so uh i started off just doing historical work and then eventually people kept asking me so many contemporary questions and i needed to know the answers so then i got more involved in the contemporary area but fisk university is what did it for me and um i will tell you i just went back there a couple months ago because one of my very closest friends um kent wallace is a physicist there and the, now the director of graduate education he runs the fisk rocket program which is an amazing program and we interviewed him, him for the book too so he's one of my really close friends so there's a question in the q a that's a, a good follow-up i know the answer so i'm gonna modify it a little bit the question <laughs> says you know so as a white woman did you receive any pushback for writing about hbcus but you can answer that question, but the other thing that I would add to that then, because you mentioned that was 1994, has that pushback or resistance changed now? Because you've been in this for 30 years. 
Um, well, it's always a good question. I will tell you in the very beginning, I used to actually write a lot about that because I was trying, I grew up in a um, all white community in the upper peninsula of Michigan, um, up near the Canada border. And so, you know, I, uh, it, there, there were not, aside from Native Americans, there were not people of color in that area where I was growing up. I had no interaction at all. Um, and so, you know, I will say that I spent a lot of time thinking about why I was even interested in this topic. I think part of it was that I felt like my schooling had robbed me of any kind of understanding of a true history of the United States. I felt like I was robbed completely and I wanted to learn. But I, so I did a lot of soul searching. At this point, I'm pretty comfortable. Uh, you know, I, I feel very comfortable, but but I would I would say that yeah I've I've, I've had pushback I've had pushback um, I would say there was a little bit early on there have been a, you know every so often someone will uh, say something um, I have uh, I've had people you know if you're gonna do work related to race people are gonna talk about you so um, and I'm sure you know Walter you've had your fair share of people coming at you so yeah people come at you sometimes I what I tell people and Levon can attest to this because Levon and I are really good friends too so um, is that you have to know who you are and why you're doing the work you're doing you've got to rem and and you got to you got to be okay with that and the other thing is you got to realize that your perspective is not the only perspective it's not the end all be all this is i think this is a great book about hbcus it is not the greatest book about hbcus it is not the end all be all it does not have all the answers um if if it were written by two other people it would be a different book and that's okay i i own every book that's been published related to hbcus believe me i own them all the minute they come out i buy them and i read them all and i'm so interested in everything that that people are writing and uh yeah but sometimes i'll tell you the fr only frustrating thing occasionally is when people uh talk about me who don't know me have never met me have never interacted with me and attribute all kinds of things to me and i'm just like you don't know me i, I you don't know anything about me right um the the good thing is there are enough people out there who do know me that they you know always kind of step in and you know i know levon's always got my back but but over the years i've become less concerned about things like that but here's one thing i decided rather than to write this book myself to ask Levon to write it with me. And I did that because I thought that that was um, the right thing to do at this moment. Um, and also something that I really wanted to do, you know, kind of collaborate, learn from each other. Most of my books have been written with uh, people of color over the years. Um, but the last HBCU focused book that I authored was written by just me when, you know, a long time ago when I was a young scholar and and yeah, so I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't let it get upset me too much, you know, at, at all. So, I mean, one thing I would add is not, it's not nearly, it's not even the same zip code or identical, but it's similar in that there have been a couple of instances since our book has come out, where, as I mentioned uh, a bit ago, uh, Walter um, and Mary Beth, that folks, you know, when they open the book, they see I'm affiliated with Penn State, and they say, well, why is a guy from Penn State? Uh, writing a book on HBCUs, and I say, you know, slow down a little bit, you know, read, right? Reading is fundamental. Read the bio, and you'll see that, you know, I attended two HBCUs, so I, I found that interesting. So it's it's similar in some respects of what may have been described in terms of this pushback, but then again, once folks see that, you know, not only having, I had, I've attended two HBCUs, but my life's work, I've been working with these institutions for 15 years plus, uh, and still continue to do that in my current role as dean of grad school at Penn State. So I find, like, similar to May, but I just find that interesting. But you got to ignore it and just keep things moving. Yeah. you, you. I'm sure you know, Walter, from being a president. I mean, at oh, a yeah. point. Well, you know, presidents, you know, you, you can't win anyway. There's no, always somebody you, that's upset with you. So I understand that. Yeah. But. And, you know, you, yeah, the way that I think about it is I've had people say to me, well, I wanted to write that book. And I, I'll say to them, well then go ahead and write it. And in fact, I'll Absolutely. introduce you to a to an editor so you can write the book you want to write, right? Go ahead and write it. There's plenty of room. And uh 
So I, I'm, I, I try to be, I really, really have worked my entire career to be as supportive as humanly possible of African-American scholars who want to do work related to HBCUs. But I will say that doesn't mean I'm not going to keep doing it because I, I love that. I love right. doing it. I, it really is something that I absolutely love. It's like in my heart. That's how I feel. Right. Yeah, no, I I think there are opportunities that this relates to one of the questions that was uh, in the Q&A that asks, you know, and you talked a little bit about it, but will there be some spinoff books, like, for example, on athletics or civil rights and HBCUs or others? I mean, there might be some, but you know, just to say, particularly for folks who will make comments to say, oh, you, why you got this white woman who's writing on HBCUs? You can write on all these, all these things, too. People aren't doing the work, so don't hate somebody who's doing the work if you aren't doing the work. You just got to do the work. I mean, there's there's so many, like I said, in this question is, I think there can be some great books about, you know, really digging into HBCUs and civil rights. Um, uh, Jelani Favors has a book that sort of leans into some of that. I mean, so there's some, great I haven't book. seen anything great really book. good in terms of HBCUs or athletics. There are some opportunities uh, to do that. So I don't know, I mean, if you, if you guys have some ideas about some, some spinoff books or ideas of things that you think people could write about. Well, I mean, I'm working on another book right now that doesn't have anything to do with HBCUs, but um, but there are all kinds of spinoff books. And again, Levon and I don't need to write those. Um, I'm happy to talk to people about it. I'm happy to uh, to introduce people to editors, publishers, always happy to do that. Um, I think that there are, um, I will say that I personally probably have a book in me about uh HBCU leadership at some point in my life. Um, it's not it's not a book I'm going to write right now. Um, I've written books related to HBCUs and fundraising. Probably not going to write another one of those for a while. Um, but I think there's lots of other areas. I think that we could use a really good authored book on HBCUs and student success. Um, there's a lot of edited stuff, but I'd love to see an authored book. I'm not going to write that. Um, I'd love to see, uh, there is a good book on HBCUs and sports. Uh, there, uh, I, I think um, I'd love to see my student Kim write a book related to HBCUs and the production of like the black arts, black curators. I think that would be great. Hopefully, I don't know if he's on, but I hope that he will do that at some point. Um, I think there are lots and lots of areas, probably maybe Laban in the future would write a book about HBCUs and mentoring because that's, we have a chapter, but wow, wouldn't it be great to have a larger book? Uh, there's so many opportunities. There's there's so many opportunities to write about HBCUs and women. You know, I, I wrote an article years ago, one of my favorite articles I've ever written called Swept Under the Rug, and it's about women at HBCUs. And uh, I um, I would love to see someone write an authored book about women at HBCUs in the student, in the faculty, among administrators. There've been some edited kinds of collections out there, but somebody to do a lot of new interviews. I would love someone to do that. I'd love for that to be written by a black woman. I, I think that would be phenomenal. Uh, so I can think of so many ideas <laughs> that that if you're reading this book, there are, there are so many dissertation topics or book topics that you could spin off on. And I personally, I welcome that. That's what being a scholar is about, right? That's what it's all about. Remember, the only thing I would add, uh, again, you hit the nail on the head. The only thing I would add is this. There's room at the table, period, right? There's room at the table. So as you, Mary Beth, have stated, as Walter say, uh, mentioned, if you want to write a book on any of these topics, Mary Beth, you just outlined, write the book. You all, you all, You always solicit uh, you always invite folks maybe to, to contact you and you want to learn about the process. I know you're willing to do that. So there's room at the table, everyone who's on this call today and those who watch this interview. So that's what you want to do. Go forth and write it. But your time is better spent and your energy is better spent doing that than criticizing folks who do this work. So I would end with that, maybe that part. All right, we got about 10 minutes left. Let me make sure I get my questions in the Q&A first. Uh, at the, early in the conversation, we talked about some of the HBCU myths that have no basis at, and that need to be refuted. What, what are some of the things that you, I think, Mary Beth, you talked about? And I, I have an idea of what you were talking about, but I'm curious in terms of things that we say that we really don't have any data to validate the truth of those kinds of things. 
Uh, well, there are a couple of myths that kind of drive me crazy. Um, and I'll tell you one data point that drives me crazy, but um, uh, uh, myths about HBCUs not being diverse. That makes me mad when I see that because not only are HBCUs number one, have the most diverse faculty in the nation of any type of category of institution, the most diverse, okay? Um, th that's number one. Uh, number two, HBCUs have incredibly diverse student bodies. Not only are they racially and ethnically diverse, but they are also diverse in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of religion, country of origin, sexuality, age, part-time, full-time, right? Like all, uh, there's so much diversity and yet you have people saying, oh, you know, an HBCU, it's not diverse, right? It's not the real world. That makes me mad when I hear people say that because that shows me that you've never been on HBCU campus. Um, so another thing that, uh, this is the the stat that kind of is baffling to me. You'll always see the stat that says that HBCUs have produced uh, it's something like 50% of this, 70% of this, 50% of this. And it's like usually doctors, lawyers, judges. Well, if you try to find the source of that, there is no source. There's no source. It's just one report um, taking that and, and reprinting it over and over. So you don't see that in our book, even though you will see the impact that HBCUs have had in those different areas. But I'm going to actually use research because that, and and I have no doubt that HBCUs have made great contributions. In fact, I know across all of those areas, but as a researcher, it bothers me when we just throw around stats that don't have any origin. And that's one of them that drives me crazy. Um, I, I would also say that um, there are myths around, here's another one that bothers me. People assume, like I, I, I read something just the other day that said that majority institutions had stolen the best and brightest students and faculty from HBCUs. What does that say about the faculty and students at HBCUs if you're telling me that the best and brightest have been stolen by majority institutions? And what I did is I, I said, I don't think you meant this, but this is how it's coming across. HBCUs should never be looked at as places that don't have the best and brightest faculty and students. Like that's racist. It's just racist, okay? Yes, you may end up with um, majority institutions being able to offer more money to faculty, but that doesn't mean everybody takes it. You know, some uh, I've I've interviewed so many faculty of HBCUs. These are the most dedicated people you will ever meet. They have huge teaching loads. They go outside of the classroom beyond comprehension serving students. I have also seen some of the most creative students I've ever met in my life at HBCUs. And I think sometimes when we use these, and I'm just going to be really frank, white metrics for describing people and talking about people, we really do a disservice. And uh, and so that that's something that bothers me when people will say, well, you know, the best and brightest don't go to HBCUs. How do you know? Do you have any data on that? Do you know where students are coming? How are you defining best and brightest? So, sorry, I'm getting a little fired up about that because it really does bother me when I hear that. And it shows me that people didn't haven't been to an HBCU. All right, sounds good. Um, one quick question, uh, and I don't know if you guys looked at this at all. Uh, someone asked, "Did you learn why Howard is called the Mecca?" Either you have a Levon doesn't care about that. That's not impressive to him anyway. So I thought it was, I thought it was you, but go ahead, man. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, that is so terrible, Levon. <laughs> um, um, we do have a whole discussion of that about why it's called Mecca, and you know, it's just like this place of of blackness coming together in all shapes and sizes and forms intellectually, culturally, it's like home, right? Um, it's leading black people home. So we have a whole section and we didn't define that. We um, uh, drew upon uh, 
those we interviewed and researched to define it. And I'll, I want you to take a look at the book if you're listening um, and go, and if you go into the um, index, you will see Mecca and you will, um, you will see how we uh, describe that because I think, uh, I think it's really powerful the way that we ended up doing it. So we use someone else's narrative to do it. Okay, very good. Um, LaVon, this is one for you. Since you attended an HBCU and currently on staff at a majority institution, based on your HBCU experience, what do you try to replicate or communicate to your Black students of color to enhance their college experience? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that question, Walter. Uh, number one for me is, and maybe that's right, we talked about this yesterday at our forum, is um, creating a sense of belonging for students. Right. In, in my role as, as this dual title role dean and, and vice provost, you know, I'm in a position now where I can do things that I could not do when I was associate, you know, for that matter, when I was a professor. So for me, you know, knowing the importance of a sense of belonging, knowing that, you know, if a black student decides to attend Penn State as a graduate student and they are then immersed in the department, you know, how do I you know, I do all that I can to try to figure out ways to engage with our college, other college deans and associate deans and so on and so forth and showcase to them the importance. You know, again, if you're going to invest time and money to bring students from HBC specifically, but more especially to Penn State, you need to do all that you can to make sure that they're successful, right? And I also will say this, I graduated, I got my PhD from Penn State so many years ago, X years ago, right? Hey, Beth. Uh, so, I know how it looks and feels, uh, how it should look, feel, sound, and smell, if you will, to be a, a Black graduate student at Penn State. My advisor at the time when I was at Penn State was a North Carolina a t grad. Uh, he's from the eastern part of North Carolina. Uh, he did a phenomenal, he was a phenomenal mentor to me. And so, and he also created a department, because at the time he was department head, he created a department where we felt like we belonged. Black students especially, but Black, White, international students, so on and so forth. So for me, I know how this is supposed to look, having attended this institution. And now, X number of years later, being able to lead the school that I graduated from, uh, and in my experience at Purdue University, or more, more especially, uh, that's that's what I'm going to do here. And I've been on record as saying that. Uh, if I was at another predominantly white institution, I would do the same thing. So for me, my experience has taught me how it should look, feel, sound, and smell. And so I, I do what I can to engage and, and to help my colleagues around campus to create spaces in the departments where students, especially black students, feel as though they're welcome. All right. So as we wrap up, I'm going to give you each one minute to sort of say what you hope people will take away from reading the book. What, what do you hope that they, they take away? Um, Mary Beth, we'll start with you. Uh, okay, so if you are a researcher or a um, a researcher, either a, a, a doc student, master student, or a faculty member, somebody doing research, I hope you will take away that um, you can write a book that speaks to a larger audience that uh, has passion in it and life in it, but that is also intellectually rigorous. I hope you will take that away because I think oftentimes we use language that is off-putting and not, uh, it, it just doesn't resonate with a lot of people. And then with regard to the overall book, uh, again, I love this book. I think it is filled with some of the most beautiful stories and I hope you love the stories. Um, I hope that uh, you will realize not only how, if you're an HBCU grad, how good your experience was, but how good others' experiences were and how complex their experiences were. And if you didn't go to an HBCU, I hope that you learn a lot about HBCUs because I think you will learn a lot. There is a lot of information uh, packed in this book. And I, I just, I want people to learn not only about HBCUs, but also about the process of, of um, writing about HBCUs. So that's what I have to say. All right, LeBron. Thank you, uh, Mary Brother. Thank you, Walter, for uh, facilitating today's interview. So what I would say, two things. One, HBCUs matter, full stop. 
It's just that simple. They matter. They make a difference. If I did not attend Florida a and start, I'll start with Florida a and FAMU, because that's where it all started for me. If I did not attend FAMU, I would not be sitting in this office as dean and vice provost of grad school at Penn State, period. I'm convinced of that. Uh, so I would encourage you to read the book, share the book widely, widely, excuse me, because again, it's a read that anyone can, can indulge in. High schooler, advanced middle schooler, aunts, uncles, so on and so forth. The second thing I will say is this. You know, I have friends that I grew up with that went to Illinois State, University of Illinois, Southern, Northern. I meet students who go to Florida State, all of you name the institution. A majority of the time, and nearly all the time, the only time I hear someone insert the word proud is when they I meet a, a graduate of Albany State, Prairie View, FAMU, A&T. I'm a proud Prairie View alum. I'm a proud Miles College alum. I'm a proud a t alum. I hear it consistently from folks who attended HBCUs. And so for me, that's powerful. Right to know that they lead with that word, that term, and they describe the institution that they attended. So for those two reasons right there, listen, they matter. Uh, they make a difference in the lives of students. And I, I would highly encourage you uh, to read the book, share the book. And, and again, I can't say it much. Thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to have written the book with you. Uh, you're dynamic. And thank you, Walter, again, for uh, conducting this interview. Yeah, no problem. It, that's, and I was thinking about that, too, in terms of proud. Um, I mean, I'll brag about the University of Georgia and say we're the oldest uh, state university in the nation, but I've never said proud. That's uh, that, I'm going to have to pay attention to when people say that. I think that is uh, that's very interesting. So I think that's a good point for people to think about. Um, so for everyone who's, who's on with us, um, just an announcement that you can save 30% on your copy of this book. If you go to the John Hopkins University press site, look up the book, and then enter the promo co code HBCU24. That's HBCU24. And you'll save 30% on the book at checkout. So make sure you get the book. Uh, as they said, and I had a chance to read it, it was a, a really easy read. Uh, I love that like one of the chapters starts with a quote from me so I can show my kids that I am somebody. <laughs> Uh, they give me a hard time. Uh, and particularly too, I actually, you know what, I think I have to get another copy for my daughter uh, as she is about to uh, go to college. And she uh, and my wife went to admitted student day at Hampton this past weekend where she got a full ride. And my wife is texting me because I was speaking in, in another state. And she was just like, I love HBCUs. My wife is a Talladega alum. Uh, but just for our daughter to have that experience and really feel good about that. So um, she's experiencing that as well. So I think that's important. Uh, I want to thank all of you for participating uh, on this, uh, this call today. Thank the Proctor Institute and the Center for Minority Serving Institutions. And of course, thanks to Mary Beth and Levine for allowing me to spend some time with them to engage in this conversation. Uh, actually gave me some good ideas of things to think about. I can't necessarily write the book I want to write until I retire because... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to have to tell everything. So, but it needs to be said <laughs> at some point. I just can't do it right now. Okay. I love it. Uh, but I love it. just as a reminder for everyone, there will be recordings that will be sent out to all of you as well. So look forward to that and then share that. Make sure people know if they couldn't make it today, we want them to go back because there's a lot of good information, good ideas in this webinar today. So once again, thanks for everyone for participating uh, in this webinar. Thank you. Take good care, everybody.